How you guys doing? All right, all right. Hopefully you all had an amazing Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays. Um, I don't know what my sister Lucero was talking about earlier about not liking desserts, but Thanksgiving is the, the uh, queen of all dessert holidays for me and in our family. You know, it's funny. I wasn't actually planning on talking about this, but, you know, do a little tangent here. You know, my family's, you guys know Christy. My wife is white. I'm black. They call it interracial. I don't believe in race. Anyway, that way. So we have a white and black, different culture relationship. And there's different dishes, you know, between the two that we all bring to Thanksgiving. Um, and Christy's mom, not, not generally speaking, you know, where I, where I grew up, we had this idea that, you know, folks that didn't look like us didn't have as much flavor and seasoning in their food, particularly around times like Thanksgiving. Well, that's a lie. Because in Christy's family, Mom Beam throws down, and she throws down every year. And I remember the first time we had Thanksgiving together, um, she, her dressing, her stuffing, her candy yams had the little cr little marshmallows and everything. I didn't even know I like marshmallows on candy yams. She threw marshmallows and everything on it. It was amazing. But that was one thing that really caught me off guard when I went to eat her sweet potato pie. And I tasted it. I said, man, something is really off here. It's like it don't have, like, the sugar in it that it's supposed to. There's something different about this. I found out it's, it wasn't sweet potato pie, it was pumpkin pie. <laughs> pumpkin pie. I'd never heard of such a thing. And my first bite into it, I was very disappointed <laughs> at what this stuff was. I was like, this is identity theft. They stole <laughs> sweet potato pie's identity and gave it over to this pumpkin stuff. So I, I've, not, I've not grown on a pumpkin pie, but everything else she makes is great, and uh, it's funny, they, uh, we had Thanksgiving with my, my side of the family this year, and my, uh, my mother-in-law came over with us. And we usually, like I said, we usually throw down, but for whatever reason, the yams and the stuffing just weren't hitting it this year, which I'd rather the turkey be messed up than the yams and the stuffing. And so Mom Beam is kind of looking around like, is anybody else tasting this, you know? <laughs> My uncle voiced his disappointment in it, so it was a great time. It was a great time being with family. I hope that you guys this year had a great time celebrating with family, um, getting to uh, take some time to be thankful. Um, I'm appreciative of all that God's blessed us with this year. I want to share a few, th a few people and a few things that I'm really thankful for. Um, one, we got some new guests here today in the Mosaic family. I don't know if you guys can see the resemblance, but two of my brothers are in here. One is my brother, Pat Hilton, and the other is my brother, Troy Bailey. If you guys could give them a round of applause. And their families, my sisters, uh, Kira and Kim are here, my nieces, kind of big brother nieces, they all came here to support today. So welcome to Mosaic. I hope you guys enjoyed your small group because that's coming up again. So that's, that's a Mosaic welcoming thing. But some of the people I'm grateful for this year, the first is my wife and my daughter. Um, and my, my two daughters are actually in this photo. You can't physically see both of them. You see the evidence of them. But my amazing, um, brilliant, well-educated, thoughtful, caring wife, um, Christy, who I am beyond grateful for and the family that, that God's blessed us with, with my daughter, Aviel Joy, my daughter, uh, Elia Grace, and then I got my two boys here, <laughs> Isaiah and Zion, who, man, I could hang out with these guys all day, every day. Um, and then our newest addition, give you a better photo of her, not the in belly photo. Elia Grace was born to us um, November 2nd. Man, and just what a miracle, a miracle and a blessing that, that she is. And... Um, I just, I, I, think, I thank God for, you know, and as I'm in this season of thinking of all the things that I'm grateful for, you know, they, they're the top of the list. But I also have to say that I'm very grateful that for three years in a row, 
three years in a row. I'm so grateful that I wasn't born in Columbus, Ohio. I know, I know there's a few people in here we got to pray for, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to point them out over there. But I'm so grateful that for three years in a row, I don't have to hear anything from a Buckeye. Praise the Lord. But even as we think about all the things that we're grateful for, we have this propensity to become ungrateful on a dime. On a dime. I saw this, uh, well, I meant to, meant to go to the next one. I saw this meme not long ago. It says, Black Friday, when people trample others for cheap goods mere hours after being thankful for what they already have. And so we can think of all these things that we're grateful for, and then all of a sudden, just, you know, the flip of a switch, here we are back to that sin nature and living in a, a lifestyle of, of a lack of gratitude, which, you know, I can, I don't too much get caught into this, um, and I can stick my nose up at them, but this morning, I don't know which way I'm pointing, this way, this morning, when I saw a snow alert that uh, we were going to have snow in Lake Odessa at 648, again, mere days after being thankful on Thanksgiving, and hours after being thankful for whooping up on the Buckeyes, here I am frustrated that we got snow this morning in Michigan. And so today we're going to talk about gratitude and the importance that it is in the um, life of the believer. And so before we get to that portion, I hope you guys remember all the groups that you're in because we're going to go back to them. And we have a few discussion questions in our group. So here's a, here's a vehicle up here. And the question is, what is this designed for? Like, what, what is the purpose of this thing? And then the second question or set of question is, where would the difficulty be if this were used as a school bus, a boat, or a tractor? So they give you guys five minutes to discuss in your groups, and then we'll come back in the message. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your love and grace, your mercy, your kindness, your goodness, the chance to be together here as brothers and sisters in you. Father, I pray that as we dive into your word, Lord, that it won't just be going through the motions. It won't just be checking a box for Sunday mornings, Father. But our hearts would be open and sensitive to what it is you have to communicate to us today, Father. I pray that um, the seed would fall on fertile ground, Father, and that it would grow and bear fruit in our lives. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so what is this designed for? This is designed for speed. It's designed for, go back to the other one still. It's designed for luxury. When you look at this vehicle, this is a Ferrari. Even the way that it's laid out, the aerodynamics of it allow for the car to go faster than others. You see the thin, fat tires. You see the nice braking system. Like everything about this car says, we're going fast, right? That's what it's made for. And if this was to be used as a school bus, uh, it wouldn't work. There would be some deficiencies that would happen with this vehicle trying to be used as a school bus. The mileage would be high because it couldn't pick up everybody at once and take them. They would have to make a lot of fast, short trips, as, we, as, as one of the groups said. Um, the kids that are inside of it would probably destroy the school bus, right? A lot of the purpose of the school bus is to get a lot of kids to school at once so that they're there on time. If you're doing one kid at a time like this, most of the kids wouldn't, either, wouldn't get, to school to ta at, uh, get to school on time. So it would, there would be some difficulties in this. If it was used as a boat, right, the car would literally die. If you sat it in water and tried to navigate it through water on top of water, it would sink. It's not built for that. It's not designed that way. If it was tried to be used as a tractor and you put a hitch on the back of it, it's not going to really be able to pull much. Right, because it's not, it's not made for that. It's not made to engage in dirt. And if you, you took this car and you put bad oil inside of it, right? It's supposed to have fully synthetic oil changes. If you put diesel oil or bad oil inside of this, the lubrication wouldn't work the right way. You'd end up getting metal on metal inside of your engine, eventually it would wear and eventually it would die. 
it was seized. Like, there's a design to this car. It's supposed to be treated a certain way. It's supposed to be used for a specific purpose. If you got rid of headlights on this vehicle, I could still operate during the day, but at night there would be some problems, especially if you live out by where I live in Lake Odessa and you got deer jumping across the road, right? You're probably going to crash. There's, there's certain components of this car that are supposed to be used for it to be at its best. In the same way, we're designed by God with a specific purpose, with specific things that are supposed to be a part of our lives. And there's things that are not supposed to be a part of our lives that lead to us being the best that we can be um, in the way that God has for us to be. I know we've talked about this a few times here in Mosaic, but in Genesis chapter 1, uh, we're told that God created us in his image and in his likeness. And we're created for his purposes, right? And the word there in the Hebrew is Selim Elohim, meaning that we're, we're created in his image to glorify him. And everything that we do is designed around us glorifying him. We're designed in a way to glorify him. And so there's certain things that the enemy wants to put in our lives that prevents us or makes it very difficult for us to accomplish that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. This clicker. Boy, let me go back. So part of bearing God's image is to be thankful. Same way that a car has to have specific kind of oil, same way that that vehicle has a specific purpose, one of our specific purposes as followers of Christ is to be thankful, to have a lifestyle of thankfulness, not just a day, not just a season, but a lifestyle of gratitude. We're not designed for jealousy. Having jealousy of other people does not glorify our God. It is to say that God doesn't love us as much as he loves them, so, and they're better, you know, because of what they have and their materialism and all these things that are most times not godly. Usually the things that we're jealous of other people for are the exact things that God doesn't want for us. And so jealousy is not a part of being, is not a part of the formula or the design of being a believer. Envy, coveting, lusting eyes, all of these things take away from who God has created us to be, take away from us being able to fulfill our purpose. Having jealousy, envy, coveting, lusting eyes, and all of these other uh, sins a part of our life is like having that Ferrari and using it in the water. It doesn't work. This isn't the, this is not the atmosphere. This is not the surroundings that this thing was designed for. And so, We'll jump, we'll jump into Scripture, and it's so funny because Victoria spoke earlier, and I, I'll have you guys to know this. Victoria, I didn't even know I was preaching until yesterday. Uh, uh, our prayers to the Philippiac family. Um, Noah has COVID, and so he subbed me in. Uh, so I got to, uh, I, the Lord knew, but I didn't know, and Victoria definitely didn't know. And that God brought us to the same passage this week. I thought that was pretty cool. But he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And how often do we hear people saying, I just want to do the will of God. I just want to know what God's will is for my life. If I could just know what God's will was for my life, I would do that. Well, he's written it here. Pray with rejoice always, which is then, again, having a heart of gratitude. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Guys, we want to live in God's will. Part of that is being thankful. Part of that is having an attitude of gratitude for what God has done for us in all seasons, in all circumstances. And it's piggybacking on that in the book of Colossians. He says, whatever you do in word or deed, whatever. What's left after whatever? Nothing. <laughs> whatever means everything, right? Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. 
And so, guys, these, this is important to our design. It's important to us. As we look through the text and we talk about all of the different things that God is calling us to, being able to witness to others and share the good news of the gospel, we can't do that if we don't have a heart of gratitude for the gospel that we've received, right? Being able to love on other people and take care of the orphan and to be there for the widow, we can't do that unless we have a, a heart of gratitude for the things that God has provided for us. And it's, it's amazing that, you know, I, I've spent a couple times in, in different missions trips, and you'll see in different countries that live on a fraction of what we have financially, and these are some of the most happy, cheerful, grateful folks that you'll ever see in your life. They live on a fraction of what we have. And even of what they get um, from us on these trips, they give to others. Somehow here in America, there's many of us that have been confused or sold the lie that we don't have enough. We don't have enough right now. And so when you believe that you don't have enough, it makes it really hard to give to somebody else. But it's a perspective. It's a perspective shift and being grateful for what God has done for you. I remember once when I was at Cornerstone University, we did a mission trip to the Philippines. And we were playing basketball out there. It was a basketball mission trip. And so we would go out, do a bunch of dunks, and then share the gospel. That was like our, our seeker-friendly way of proclaiming the gospel. It's like nothing opens up the eyes of, or open up the hearts of young children like seeing a basketball get, you know, dunked. So they're throwing up alley-oops, dunking them. Kids are like, ah, and then we, boom, hit them with Jesus, right? And so it was an awesome time. But I remember while we were out there, um, I, I'd never seen such poverty like this. There were individuals whose homes, and I know people, we used to joke about this as kids, like, oh, you, you live under, you know, four sticks in a slatter. You live under, like, we used to joke with each other like that. I'd never seen anybody actually live this way. There were four posts and a tin top, and there were families that were, like, that was their living quarters. Never seen poverty like this in my life. And we're out there, and it was really humbling for me, so we go out there, and um, at this basketball, at the halftime of this basketball game, we're throwing out different things to the crowd, and people are excited, you know, headbands and T-shirts and all this. And somebody gave me a flat basketball. It's like, hey, throw this to the crowd. It's like a flat basketball. Who wants a flat basketball? I know I would not want a flat. And I was like, and nobody here has a pump. I don't think anybody could afford a pump. It's like, this is, I was like, this is kind of rude to throw out there. But they said, hey, throw it out. I said, okay, cool, man. So I took this flat basketball, met ice with this kid in the crowd, and I tossed it. There was a swarm of people that converged on and fought for a flat basketball that not one kid that grew up on the east side of Detroit where I'm from would have won it. And I sat there, I'm like, man, how grateful should I be just from the upbringing that I had? And I, I fully thought I grew up poor, but I grew up much wealthier than a lot of these other families, but I never had that perspective. And there are people that were in some of these other countries and in some of these other communities that would was, that was sacrifice anything to live in a certain situation that you have today. Wherever, wherever it is you live in America today, there's people that are, I know I'm going on a, on a tangent now, there's people that are, that are fighting to cross borders, sending their children. I won't send my children down the street without me knowing what's going on. They're sending their children into other countries for an opportunity to live here. And oftentimes, we don't even appreciate that God blessed us to be here. And so it's a perspective shift, right? It's a perspective shift. And so I want to I wanna take a second to, to share that gratitude is a perspective. It doesn't mean that things are necessarily different. It just means recognizing in your situation what God has done. I call this the uh, $10 million question. I saw this guy talking about this a few months ago, $10 million question. Um, I'll pick on Kyle here. Kyle, if I gave you, I don't have it, but if somebody gave you $10 million, would you be grateful for that? 
Raise your hand if you'd be grateful if somebody gave you $10 million tomorrow. Like, I t- raise your hand if you would be like, if you if you casually grateful, okay, don't raise your hand. But if you would be like wildly grateful, like running in the streets, hallelujah, chanting. If somebody gave you $10 million, say, heck yeah, you would. You'd be going crazy, right? Huh? I'd be on Facebook, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I'd be in the middle of the street screaming, hallelujah. They think I'm a crazy person, and I wouldn't care because I got blessed with $10 million. Do you know what that would do for my life? Do you know what that would do for my family? Like, do you know how, how big of a deal? Of course you guys know that. But if somebody said, Kyle, hey, I'm going to give you $10 million tomorrow, or I'm going to give you $10 million today, but you have to die tomorrow, would you still want that $10 million? Some people, some people, yeah. Most of us, no. Because now that, now that $10 million isn't worth as much because you know, what are you going to enjoy it on, right? So your life, your life for most of us is worth more than the $10 million. Waking up tomorrow is worth more to you than $10 million. But when you wake up tomorrow, do you have a heart of gratitude that same way? Are we that grateful tomorrow? I'll throw you a different one. We give you $10 million, but your children have to die tomorrow. Or your grandchildren have to die tomorrow. You get $10 million, you get to enjoy it, $100 million. What, what, number, what number would we put on that? There is no number. Which means that tomorrow when your kids wake up, it's worth more to you than a hundred million dollars. But are we grateful like that when our, when our kids wake up tomorrow? Do we hug them and thank God? Are we yelling hallelujah in the streets? My kids woke up tomorrow because it's not guaranteed. And there's people who don't have their kids wake up tomorrow. It's our same situation. It's the same life. It's just your perspective on it. How do I, how, do I appreciate what God is doing for me? Or does Satan have us distracted and looking at other things where we're envious, where we're gluttonous, where we're coveting? Are we looking at what we don't have or are we looking at what we do have? You have over $100 million worth of value by your own professed valuation, over $100 million worth of value. But do we look at it that way? So our relationships are worth more than the money. We should have gratitude that same way. Even health. And I think if I say, hey, if you or your kids, hey, here's $10 million, but tomorrow you're going to be blind, deaf, and in, with all sorts of the disease and in extreme pain for the rest of however long you live. Most people would say, you know what? I'm good. And people that are in that situation would pay $10 million to get out of it, which means your health is worth more than $10 million. The health that you currently have, whether you're sick, whether you have cancer, whether whatever you currently have is worth more to you than $10 million. But do we have a gratitude that way? And are we grateful to God even in the difficulty of our current situation? Do we have the perspective to know that, man, God is, God is doing incredible things for me. God is holding us together. God is sustaining us. Guys, because that, is, that glorifies him. That's the heartbeat that he wants us to have. That's the rejoice always in all things. When he's saying in all things, it means everything. In all situations, can I give praise to him, celebrate him, and be grateful for what he's done? And it goes even further, because even into death, right? Because what does Paul say? You know, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Even if I die, it gets better. Like, that's something to, the security that we have in salvation in Christ is worth more than any tangible asset here on earth. Do we look at it that way, and do we walk with that gratitude every day? Or does somebody cutting us off on 131 throw us into a tizzy 
where all of a sudden, all of life is terrible? Does watching snow drop in Michigan in the morning, which I, listen, was humble. I had to add in the slide after I felt that way this morning to call, my, call myself out on it and say, hey, does snow dropping from the sky all of a sudden tick you off so bad that we, we're, we forget all that God has done for us this morning? My wife woke up this morning. My daughters woke up this morning. My kids woke up this morning. I'm more blessed than I could ever imagine. And that's even without a dollar. Gratitude is a perspective. And gratitude isn't reserved for just when things are going well. We read in Acts 5, the apostles at this time are sharing the good news and I believe it's the Sadducees and the high priests that are coming against them and are looking to uh, imprison them and eventually persecutes them. If you guys know the story of, uh, what's his name, Gamaliel, I believe it's the guy's name. Um, he gives this, this uh, challenge to the, uh, to the high priest and saying, hey, if these guys are not with the Lord, you know, just let them go about their way because eventually it's going to fall apart. And if they are with the Lord, there ain't nothing you can do to stop them anyway. So you might as well just let them go. And the, the high priest takes his advice, flogs these people, sends them along their way. And so think about it. These are people that got flogged. These are individuals that for, for following the instructions of Christ got beaten. And this is their experience in Acts 5. It says, so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not stop teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus as the Christ. These are people that, rejoiced, that were rejoicing because they got beaten. They got persecuted and they were set. What, what, puts you in that, what puts you in that perspective? Being focused on Christ, not being focused on your situation, not being focused on how you physically feel, but what God has done for you, knowing that he's the king of kings and Lord of lords and that he loves you. Those things give you the opportunity to live like this. And this isn't just a one-off. We read in Romans 5, it says, and not only this, this is Paul writing another letter, but we also celebrate in our tribulations. Now, I know when we had Thanksgiving, most of us probably celebrated some good things that happened in our life. You know, I don't know if one of us was like, man, boy, you know that time that such and such punched me in the face? Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> like, they, they were celebrating in tribulations because of the perspective shift, right? Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Guys, that's not a limited perspective on your situation. That is a godly macro perspective that in, in all things, it's, we read later in Romans, that God works all things together for the good of those that love him. We can be grateful today. We don't have to wait till tomorrow. And it's interesting that you'll oftentimes find this, that God gives instruction, and maybe the scientific community understands it at the time, and sometimes they don't. Like, uh, you know, if you read in the Old Testament, there's uh, a lot of instruction on what to eat, what to not eat, what to... What to uh, remove yourself from, how to cook certain things, how to not cook certain things. They didn't have any food safety experts at the time. They just had the God of the universe giving them instruction and saying, hey, this is what you should do. The designer said, hey, this is how you should do it. Now, here we are, I don't know, 4,500 years later, and I'm fortunate enough to work in a restaurant space right now, and you go through these food safety courses, and it's just so odd to find that all of the things God says, like, hey, you really want to be cautious about this? They're like, yo, we find you should really be cautious about this because, hey, if you don't cook this a certain way or you engage this animal, you could end up with trichinosis and all these different. I'm like, whoa, who, who would have thought? Who would have known? The God of the universe knew, right? The God, God has not given us commands, guys, just to, you know, be insensitive or to steal from your fun. He's given us commands to protect us. He's given us commands 
because he loves us. He's given us command because he's designed us for a specific purpose. And for us to be able to execute on that, we have to live a certain way. But it's interesting. Now the scientific community sees health benefits of gratitude. This is from Psychology Today. Gratitude improves physical health, enhances empathy and reduces aggression. You sleep better and longer with gratitude. If you find yourself up in the middle of the night all the time, it's, check the gratitude box. It improves self-esteem. You mean not looking at other people and coveting and envious? Well, you know how God said, hey, don't cover your neighbor's house. Don't cover your neighbor's wife. Don't cover your neighbor's. You mean that actually improves your self-esteem? Yes, because I'm grateful for what God's done for me. I'm not worried about anything else. It improves mental strength. This is from research.com. 35 health benefits of gratitude. Helps you to sleep. I didn't do all 35. Helps to lower high blood pressure. Helps to prevent overeating. Motivates you to exercise more. Helps strengthen your immune system. Improves pain tolerance. Helps you get glucose levels under control. Extends your lifespan. Improves patience. Boosts self-esteem. Makes you less materialistic. Helps in recovery from addiction. We talked about, we've been in a series about habits and hangups. Gratitude. Gratitude having a lifestyle of it, like Victoria said, not just for a day, not just for a holiday. As a lifestyle, helps in recovery from addiction, helps the battle against depression, gratitude. This is essential for us, essential for us to live the, the life God has in store for us. And there's more, heart.org, Forbes Health, Harvard Health, UCLA, UCLA Health, and many more. Again, not that we need any of them to give us the instruction. God gives us the instruction. But isn't it interesting that all of them are now catching up to what God said over 2,000 years ago is important for your life. The last one that's one of my favorites. This is from, did I go the wrong way? Oh, shoot. The Mayo Clinic. Here we go. Mayo Clinic, one of the most recognized health institutions in the United States. This is Amanda Logan, uh, one of the researchers for him. Studies have shown that feeling thankful can improve sleep, mood, and immunity. Gratitude can decrease depression, anxiety, difficulties with chronic pain, and risk of disease. If taking a pill, if taking a pill could do this, everyone would be taking it. And God's given it to us right in our hearts. You don't need a prescription. Well, it's already been prescribed. We need to do it, right? Guys, it's certainly, there's certainly, Satan certainly presents to us reasons to be ungrateful in our lives. No surprise. I'm not saying there's not atrocities that happen in this world. I'm not saying that there's not difficulties in our day. I'm not saying that life is easy. Life wasn't easy for the first people in the first church that were being persecuted. What I am saying is that we get to choose how we respond to situations. We can either bring worry or we can find gratitude. One of those ways, don't lead down a path that the Lord has for you and the other does. The same as I heard this, um, I heard this once before. It said, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping that the other person dies. That's what unforgiveness does to us. It's like drinking poison, hoping that it hurts you. Well, it's not. It's just hurting me. Inversely, guys, gratitude, regardless what you're going through, gratitude is an instruction of the Lord, and it tremendously helps us physically, and it helps us to be able to live out the life that God has for us. Amen. Let's pray, and then um, we're going to go into our time of communion. Father, Lord, we come here today with a heart of gratitude, with hearts of gratitude, Lord, grateful for 
everything for it all, Lord. For what we perceive as the good and even what we feel like is the bad, Lord. We're grateful knowing that you are in control of it all and that in you is hope, in you is life, in you is a future. Lord, we're grateful for the way that you've designed us, Father. Um, and I pray that as a, as a body of brothers and sisters in you, Lord, that we would honor your design and live it out in the purposes of gratitude, Lord, that we would be grateful when we wake up tomorrow morning. That we would be grateful when we walk out of these doors today, Father, that the next breath that we take, we would be grateful for, knowing that it wasn't guaranteed. Father, we're also grateful that whenever we take our last breath, that we would be absent from the body just to be present with you. And that in the new life, in the new kingdom, in the new heaven, in the new earth, there'll be no more of the things that tempt us to be ungrateful, Father. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more disease that we'll live in perfection with you, Father. And so we're grateful for the hope and the promise that we have in that. And in between that time and now, Father, I pray that we will honor you, love you, that we would share your good news with as many people as possible, welcome, welcoming them into that relationship with you, Father, that we would be examples of your love, that we would be the Imago Dei, the Selim Elohim, that glorify you and love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And we thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.